Now, Nicole's asked me this year to talk about a slightly different topic to what we've spoken about the last couple of years. Um, and really this year we're going to focus on all the things that happen up until the point where treatment starts. So really looking at diagnosis and staging and those type of things. We've spent the last couple of years talking about some of the newer treatment options that are available, as well as putting into context some of the more old-fashioned treatments and, and why they're still relevant today. Now, this is the bad news slide. I'll get it out of the way earlier on. One of the biggest problems that we face with lymphoma is it's really common. Overall, it's actually the fifth most common type of malignancy. Um, so things like breast cancer, lung cancer, bowel cancer are ahead of it. But one of, the, one of the great travesties is that people know about those things. Those diseases are out there in the public consciousness and people are aware of strategies to try to pick those particular diseases early. I don't think we've done a good enough job yet of getting lymphomas out there into the mainstream consciousness and getting people to understand about you know signs and symptoms of lymphoma such that an early diagnosis can be made. I think there's a lot of progress now happening with that. Organisations like the Leukaemia Foundation are trying to sort of promote awareness and, and they're also acting as you know, an advocacy organisation for lymphomas. The other thing that remains a little bit unclear is that the number of diagnoses of lymphoma that we're making each year continues to increase and has been doing so since about the 1950s. Now, we have no real understanding for why that is. It's more than just the case that we're diagnosing it more often. You could argue that maybe 30, 40 years ago, people perhaps succumbed to lymphoma without ever having the diagnosis made. It is more than that. There is a reason why it's increasing in incidence that we haven't quite worked out. At least in part, one of the reasons why we don't know why the incidence is increasing is because for the majority of people, we don't know what causes lymphoma. Um, we know that a range of infectious organisms seem to increase the risk for it. Um, gland the glandular fever virus or Epstein-Barr virus, the classical ones, in Africa it's associated with a highly aggressive type of B-cell lymphoma called Burkitt's lymphoma. The type of Burkitt's lymphoma we see in Australia isn't associated with the Epstein-Barr virus, but again around about a third to a, a half of all patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma we can actually locate the Epstein-Barr virus inside the Hodgkin cells, which suggests that it is that virus that actually perhaps stimulates the lymphoma to develop. Um, even other things like hepatitis C, for example, a virus who you, you wouldn't expect um, would have a role to play in lymphomas. People with hepatitis C have a far greater incidence of, of lymphomas. And in some of those patients, particularly if they have one of the very slow-growing type of lymphomas, if you actually just treat the virus with treatment, without worrying about treating the lymphoma, the lymphoma itself can actually disappear. Down the bottom there are a couple of bacteria, so there's a, there's a type of lymphoma of the stomach called uh, gastric malt lymphoma, which is almost certainly driven by Helicobacter. Helicobacter is the bacteria that is now well known to cause ulceration of the tummy and the duodenum. Um, in some people, it can actually drive lymphomas to occur. And the first treatment that we use in this circumstance, again, is antibiotic treatment to eradicate the bacteria. And once again, you can actually see the uh, lymphoma respond just simply to antibiotic treatment. There's a whole range of environmental possibilities, uh, particularly things like solvent and benzene exposures, um, high-dose radiation treatments, say um, mm -hmm. the high-voltage power lines, are uh, implicated, but they're not clearly ever been shown to be um, a consequence. People who have deficiencies of the immune system, so whether they're either born with them or, for example, in the setting of where they've acquired the HIV virus, which knocks out the immune system, lymphomas have a higher incidence in that group. Um, and as I say, we presume that there's a genetic susceptibility. Again, it, we don't know in the majority of people, so it's unlike, say, in the breast cancer setting, where we do know there's some fairly quite clearly established um, susceptibility, genetic susceptibilities to development of breast cancer. <clears throat> Billions of dollars of research going into those type of things, yeah. So I mean there's a lot of research happening looking at new treatments and you know the, and why lymphomas do what they do but there is also a lot of research happening into what actually leads to lymphomas including genetic susceptibilities. That will probably gain a lot of pace now because the, now that the Human Genome Project has fully mapped out the, our genetic code, 
it'll be much, much easier for them to actually sort of explore particular candidate genes that they think might be relevant. Certainly we know that you know, patients who went through Maralinga, Hiroshima, Nagasaki had a much higher incidence of lymphomas and leukaemias. Some of the long-term survivors of people who are at ground zero and 9-11 uh, seem to be now having a higher incidence of development of lymphomas as well and again presumably related to you know, the toxic dust and that they were exposed to from the buildings. So really the, the golden rule for today's talk is all about diagnosis and that really getting the right diagnosis is the single most important thing that we have to do as doctors. And essentially because everything else that follows comes from that accurate diagnosis. So the, all of the treatment strategies and that will all depend upon getting that diagnosis right up front. It helps us tell you the way your lymphoma is behaving, where, whether it's aggressive or slow growing. It helps guide the type of treatment we need to give or whether in fact we need to give treatment. Not all lymphomas need treatment, but also but obviously prognosis. You know, what our expectation would be of your future based on what we find from that diagnosis. Now, everybody who gets diagnosed with lymphoma, it's done in one of three ways. The easiest technique is this thing called a fine needle aspirate. It's a terrible test for mm. diagnosing lymphomas. Um, basically, this is the type of image that you get looking down a microscope. It's a little bit blurred here, but this is a really good way of diagnosing cancer of the cervix. So a pap smear essentially looks fairly similar to this. So the pathologist look down a microscope at a pap smear result and make a diagnosis of cancer of the cervix. They couldn't look down a microscope and make, make a diagnosis of lymphoma um, or even uh, work out what type of lymphoma it was. The second next best test and second next least invasive is this concept of a true cut biopsy or core biopsy. And this is something that will commonly happen in, say, the diagnosis of breast cancer, where a, a lump is picked up on an ultrasound or a mammogram. The next step is to do a core biopsy. And again, to make diagnosis of breast cancer and to work out what type of breast cancer it is, this technique is sufficient. In lymphomas, you will get a diagnosis, an accurate diagnosis, about a third of the time with this particular technique. So ultimately, what we normally have to do is actually get a surgeon involved and actually remove a lymph gland entirely. The reason is that you then get a large sample of tissue. The pathologist can then make lots of different cuts into that tissue so they've got plenty of samples to look at. The other thing is that it's not just a case of looking down the microscope. There's lots of other fancy tests that the pathologists do. Looking at markers on the outside of the cells, looking at the genetic structure of the lymphoma cells. All of those things are needed these days for the pathologist to come up with an accurate diagnosis. So for example, this is what follicular lymphoma looks down the microscope. You can get the appearance that there's discrete circles and that's the follicles. And, the, um, and that's the reason why follicular lymphoma is given that particular name. So follicular lymphoma is the most common of all the slow growing lymphomas. So just short of a third of patients with lymphoma will have this particular subtype. This is diffuse large cell lymphoma. Again, this is on a much higher power than we saw before. But a pathologist looking down the microscope would instantly recognise these as very abnormal lymphoid cells. They're very large, very angry looking nuclei. So that's classical of, of the, being a large cell lymphoma. And unlike the follicular form, it diffusely involves the lymph glands. You don't get the maintenance of those discrete follicles you get the whole sort of lymph gland obliterated by the disease because it's behaving in a more aggressive manner. So again, diffuse large cell lymphomas, the most common of the lymphomas that we see. So just over a third of patients will have this as their diagnosis. Um, this is an example of nodular sclerosing Hodgkin's lymphoma. So basically, the black dots, again, that you can see within there, that's the, the normal uh, lymphoid tissue. And you can see this sort of these pink fibres almost extending around and this is the sclerosing or scar bit. So um, again nodular sclerosing Hodgkin's is the most common form of Hodgkin's that we diagnose and the pathologist will see these classical scar tissue and that helps them make that diagnosis. The scarring is thought to be driven by um, the active cells in the, in the lymphoma. And again this is a little bit hard to, to pick but this thing here 
this thing here uh, read Sternberg cells. The normal black dots are normal reactive lymphocytes. So they're basically an immune response by the body to these reed sternberg cells. And it's those reed sternberg cells that are the hallmark of, of most types of Hodgkin's lymphoma. And so again, a pathologist looking down the microscope will see those and almost instantaneously be able to make a diagnosis of Hodgkin's. So broadly speaking, the easiest way to think about lymphoma is to divide it up into the non-Hodgkin's and then the Hodgkin's subtype. Um, within the non-Hodgkin's group, divided up into B and T cells, there are, are other really rare subtypes um, there, but you know, 95% of people with non-Hodgkin's will fit into a B or a T cell. The overwhelming majority of them will be B cell lymphomas. T cell lymphomas are relatively rare. Within the Hodgkin's group, there's um, a, t a, a subset now called nodular predominant lymphocyte, sorry, nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin's. It's been cleaved off from the rest of classic, ho classical Hodgkin's lymphoma because in some ways it's thought to behave more like a, a non-Hodgkin's B-cell lymphoma. Now, the whole system is evolving over time. Back in the 1960s, the only way lymphoma was diagnosed was the pathologist looking down the microscope. That was the way they made the diagnosis. So they had a very simple classification system back in those days. And ultimately, we've ended up with the World Health Organization, or WHO, WHO classification. It's now been revised, so there's a new publication of that in 2008. And in 2015, it's expected will be a third version of that. Now, the reason why the classification system is getting better is because of all of the new molecular techniques and special things that, um, in, that are available in laboratories to work out the very intricacies of these lymphomas. So it's not just about looking down the microscope, it's looking for other fancier things now. Now, it means that it becomes very complicated. Um, so this is an example of the majority of the types of B-cell lymphomas that we see. And as I said, basically follicular and diffuse large B-cell lymphoma make up about two-thirds of all of the lymphomas that we see. But included in these things are things like um, hairy cell leukaemia, um, CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukaemia, um, and I'll come back this to leukaemia lymphoma uh, distinction uh, in, a, in a future slide. Um, things like Burkitt's lymphomas, and even myeloma technically, which we always consider as a completely different disease, really is a, is a, a, a subset of B-cell lymphomas. Waldenstrom's real name is lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma, or LPL, so oh, I've attached it there. I haven't got the little umlaut thing or whatever it's called above the O, though, which is meant to be there. Um, T-cell lymphoma is the best way we think about those, is what site they predominantly involve. So, for example, uh, many of the T-cell lymphomas will typically present as a leukaemia. Many will present as just disease involving the skin, but potentially uh, moving on to um, other sites like uh, the lymph glands. Or they can involve just the lymph glands or other things like the liver or the spleen. Um, so we tend to classify T-cell lymphomas in a slightly different way to B-cells. And again, they're rel relatively rare. T-cell lymphomas tend to behave more aggressively on the whole than B-cell lymphomas. And also because they're relatively rare, we're never quite certain that we know how to best treat them. One of the good things about a B-cell lymphoma is that there's overwhelming amounts of evidence about how they're best treated in most circumstances. Because T-cell lymphomas are rare, we just don't have that body of evidence to, to really help guide us. So there will always be that little bit of doubt sometimes when we're treating some of the T-cell lymphomas about whether we're giving the, the best treatment for that particular disease. Now, as I mentioned before, um, Hodgkin's lymphoma is divided up into its four classical subtypes and then this other fifth subtype, which is now considered slightly different from the rest of the group. Um, we no longer worry too much about distinction because the treatment ultimately for all of these subtypes is the same. Um, there used to be talk about, for example, the lymphocyte uh, rich group not doing as well as people with nodular sclerosing Hodgkin's. Essentially these days with the type of treatments and things like PET scans where we can work out whose disease is behaving badly, um, we no longer worry too much about the individual subtype. Um, so back in the old days, so going back to the 70s and 80s, the, the, the classification system was this thing called the working formulation. And even though we've moved well beyond that now, 
to keep things simple even in our, our minds, we actually still really consider lymphomas often in the three subsets based on their biological behaviour. So we talk about the slow growing or indolent ones, we talk about the um, aggressive or intermediate grade lymphomas and then the highly aggressive or um, high grade lymphomas. So as I said, follicular lymphoma is one of those slow growing ones, diffuse large B cell, one of the aggressive ones. So it actually helps us plan out treatments because essentially one of the ways that we think about treatment is we fight fire with fire. That's a, it's one of the simple ways that we can sort of work out fairly early on in somebody's disease course how intensive the treatment needs to be. So a relatively low grade type of lymphoma you would expect most of the time could be treated with relatively low grade types of treatment. Whereas things like Burkitt's lymphoma is an incredibly fast growing tumour and needs to be treated therefore with very aggressive styles of treatment. <clears throat> now different lymphomas behave in different ways. So this is another reason why getting the right diagnosis is important. So you mentioned Wardenstrom's before. One of the classical features of Wardenstrom's is it involves the bone marrow. And that's almost always how we make the diagnosis. Somebody turns up with a high protein, we do a bone marrow test, we the find Wardenstrom cells. It doesn't often involve any of the lymph glands or the liver or the spleen. It can do, but it's not common. Burkitt's lymphoma, as I mentioned, that really high, highly aggressive one, has a terrible predilection for getting into the brain and the spinal fluid as a complication. So part of the treatment strategy that we use is to cover for that possibility. So we need to use intensive treatments that get from the blood across into the brain. And not most chemotherapies don't get across that blood-brain barrier. But also, we often need to give lots and lots of lumbar punctures or spinal taps to give treatment into that spinal fluid to not usually treat, but to try to prevent the lymphoma from ever coming back into that sort of space. So marginal zone lymphomas most typically occur outside the lymph nodes and occur in organs like the stomach or the spleen. And they often just involve the stomach or the spleen and they don't involve anywhere else. Um, with the two common ones that we talk about, diffuse large cell lymphoma rarely involves the bone marrow, whereas follicular lymphoma more often than not does involve the bone marrow. So knowing a little bit about the diagnosis can help us work out what, you know, how the disease is likely to behave. So that's another important reason um, for um, um, finding out the right diagnosis. We also give this information sometimes to the pathologist. So if, if they're struggling to come up with the an accurate diagnosis, if we provide them with a little bit of clinical history, it can often help them work out which particular lymphoma it might actually be.